Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Let's uh, get a hymn book and open it to hymn number 335, and we'll sing Standing on the Promises. 335. Can't sing standing on the promises. That's right. You got to stand to sing it. <laughs> <laughs> Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let His praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of Standing on the promises they can <coughs> when the howling souls are down and fear us say, by the living word of God I shall prevail. Standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing. Christ the Lord, bound to Him eternally by love's strong cord, overcoming daily by the Spirit's sword, standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing. Hymn number 544, Redeemed How I Love to Proclaim It. Lovely 
guardeth my footsteps and giveth me songs in the night. I'm redeemed, I'm redeemed, I'm redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. I'm redeemed, I'm redeemed, His child and Hymn number 573. Set my soul on fire. Amen. Set my soul on fire, Lord, for thy holy word. Burn it deep within me. Let be heard millions broke in darkness in this day and hour I will be a witness fill me with thy power set my soul on fire oh, set my soul on fire make my life a witness for thy sake Sunday night after preaching twice in the morning, I can run out of steam, my voice does, and so I always need a little extra oomph to uh, get me through. You notice that my my most faithful member is not here tonight. Yeah. Yeah. She is, uh, she's, she is, I battled a cold the last part of the week, coughing like crazy, hoping and praying it wasn't going to be the COVID, which I'm sure it wasn't. It was a, old cold like I get where I just cough my head off for about a day and uh, she's been coughing all afternoon and uh, so I told her I said if you don't feel like coming then you stay home and, and we'll we'll do go on without you but I said I, I don't know what I'll do without my most faithful uh, hearer so baby if you're sitting there watching just know I love you <laughs> 
She's probably not watching. She's probably asleep. But let's take our Bibles. Let's go to Exodus chapter 33 and get started tonight, all right? Exodus 33. Now, we're in a real unique time of the history of Israel at this point because they've been uh, redeemed or they've been led out of Egypt. They've been brought through a portion of the wilderness. Uh, God has provided for them. God's taken care of them. God's, God's watched over them. He's provided their meals. He's provided their water. Uh, he's been so good to them. He finally gets to Mount Horeb, which is the, the Mount of God, Mount, and Mount Sinai, uh, excuse me, and uh, he says this is, and this is where he gives them the law. And so he's given them the law, and of course what's happening is, here's what happened, and this is what you've got to remember. The children of Israel were delivered out of Egypt, but they never got free of Egypt. They, they, that's what they were, they were so much enslaved to that mentality they had in Egypt that they struggled with that all the way through the wilderness. In fact, it will cost them their opportunity to go into the promised land, as we will, we will find out sooner or later. But I want you to remember the children of Israel are headed for the promised land, where we're at right now in this passage. They're headed for the promised land. They violated God's word by building this idol. Of course, Moses came down, crushed the idol, crushed it, poured it into the water, made them drink it. Uh, there were those who, who perished because of it. And, uh, but uh, in the end... They have, uh, they, they have been unruly. They have been, and remember God even said, you need to go down, Moses, and take care of your children. Yeah. And God said, wait, and Moses said, wait a minute, those are your children. No, no, and we're going to see that again tonight. But understand, they're in the promised land. They're headed for the promised land. They're, that's what God wants them to be. God wants them to be in the promised land. Now, let me just explain to you, as a child of God, God wants you to live as a victorious Christian. Yeah. He wants you to live the victorious Christian life. And that is symbolic of what the promised land is to Israel, is what the victorious Christian life is to the Christian. Where we are spirit-filled, where we walk in the spirit, where we walk in Christ, where we're experiencing the victories of God. That's what the promised land is to us as born-again believers. God, when he saved you, that's where he wanted you to go. And he's been working on you ever since you got saved to get you there. He, he brings you three things. He tries to build your faith. He tries to get you to understand how he works. And the more he does, you know, sometimes it's just harder to get there. You know what? We didn't pray, did we? No. Well, we better do that. Right. Let's pray before I go any further. Lord, I thank you, Lord, for the opportunity you have to look at the word tonight. And I pray, Father, as we get into this text, that we'll see, Father, not just the history of Israel, but, Father, we'll see the history of us, how that we are this people and that you have such a desire and a love for us and that we should be instantly obedient to you to follow the way you want us to go so that we could be victorious as Christians. We love you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So here they are as Israel. They're in a time of preparation. They're there at, the, at the mount. They've been in a time of preparation and that God's been trying to grow their faith so as they'll be ready when they get to the promised land to go in. We are growing in our faith in preparation for the victorious Christian life. Do not choose to live at the mount or in the wilderness. Choose not to be satisfied until you reach that victorious Christian life. There is great satisfaction. There's great blessing that comes if we get to that promised land for us. So understand that as the background behind what we're about to look at. In Exodus 33, verse 1, And the Lord said to Moses, Depart, go up hence, thou and the people which thou hast brought up out of the land of Egypt, unto the land which I swear unto Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying unto thy seed, Will I give it? So here is God saying, this is my desire for Israel. I want them to go to the promised land. I want them to have what I have prepared for them. I want them to walk in the land of milk and honey. He's going to explain it a little bit. I want them to have all the things that I've, I have planned for them. And uh, he said, these are the things I've promised their forefathers from Abraham and Isaac and Jacob before they ever were caught in uh, uh, bondage in Egypt. He said, my desire was for them to take Canaan, to live there in the promised land. And now I'm leading them. I'm wanting to get them there. So he tells uh, Moses, get up and get going. Let's get them there. That's kind of what the command was. 
So we see the promise that God is going to keep, even though he's frustrated with their rebellion at this point. Verse 2, and I will send an angel before thee. Now we've heard that before. It was about 10 chapters past. Back in chapter 23, verse 20, the Lord promised, or God promises that he's going to send the angel. And you remember we talked about it, that probably he's talking about the angel of the Lord who is none other than a pre incarnate Jesus Christ that, uh, that came and would have led them through the wilderness. Here, though, he talks about sending an angel, not the angel. And I find that he's, he's frustrated with them. He's not going to leave them alone, but he's not going to take care of them himself by sending the angel, the Lord. Instead, he'll send an angel of the Lord to one of the created angels to go before them. And he will use that angel to give them guidance and to leadership. Now, isn't that something? I mean, God started out that he was leading them. Now, these angels are going to be the ones that are going to be involved in that. And he says, I will drive out. Now, watch this. And I will drive out the Canaanite, the Amorite, the Hittite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, the Jebusite. He's going to drive out. And I'm going to tell you what's cool about that. When he says it, you're going to see him say those names over and over again. And to me, it's an identification. It's telling them, when you see me defeating those people, you know you've reached the promised land. When you see that I put you in the land where these people are in, in leadership or they're the ones that think they own the land, you're home. You're home. Now, it's interesting because you might think, well, the promised land ought to be a place where we don't have to battle, where we don't have to fight, where we don't have to. But see, the promised land was never that. The first thing they did when they crossed over to the promised land was to fight the battle of Jericho. And we find it's battle after battle after battle. So the promised land for them was not necessarily heaven. And for us, it's not heaven. It's the victorious Christian life where we win victories, where we win the battles, where we see God take charge and guide us through winning the victories, even though there are those battles that have to be fought. And that's the case here. These are those people groups possessing the land at that time. And God said, I will drive them out. I like that too because for me as a Christian, it really tells me that as I want to live in the victorious Christian life and I have to face those times of uncertainty or those times that are faith testers, God is going to be there to, to drive out the enemy, to work for me, to get me to that place. It's not something about me having to do it. It's about him doing it for us. Boy, don't ever forget that. You know, living for God, living for the Lord Jesus Christ is not a problem if you let him do it. It becomes a problem when you tend to think you're the only one that can do it. And you'll find you'll fall short every cotton picking time. Amen. And I say cotton picking because I've been there many, many cotton picking times. So that tells you about it. But these are the people he's going to drive out. Now he goes on verse 3. And he's going to take them unto a land flowing with milk and honey. Now, you've heard that many times, haven't you? Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I've been to Israel. And uh, I didn't see milk or honey flowing out of the, the crevices of the rocks. I, I, I didn't see that. In fact, a lot of the land is pretty desolate. You know, there's desert parts of it. And the parts that they've irrigated now, are, of course, are growing like crazy. And I questioned that. I thought, where, did, where does that come from? And from what I understand, that was kind of a, a uh, yeah, a description that was used like we would use, you know, uh, good as peanut butter on bread, or you know, it's just an expression that they used of something that's better or the best. It's the land flowing milk and honeys. I mean, you're, you buy a piece of land. That's the land flowing milk and honey. It must be a good piece of property. It's going to produce. It's going to do everything. And uh, that's what that meant. Uh, although they did produce many cows there that did produce milk, and they probably had lots of beehives all over the place where they did have honey. But we found when they finally go in, what do they find? They find the grapes of Eskel, and they find all these wonderful things that are there. But it's just an expression. He says, for I will not go up. Now listen to this. Under the land of Florida, for I will not go up in the midst of thee. For thou art a stiff-necked people, lest I consume thee in the way. 
And I think God may be just a little bit upset with them. What do you think? I think maybe God's kind of got a little burr in the saddle towards them. I will not go up in the midst of thee. Now, all the time they've been moving, he has been. He's been right there with them. He's been walking with them, always with them, always around them. They saw the cloud by day, the pillar far by night. His presence was always there. But now he's saying that I'm not going to be in the midst of thee. I'm not going to walk in the midst. He said, because you've become so stiff-necked. Stiff-necked. Tell me what to do. You're not my daddy. Right? Stiff necked. I mean, you just, you just kind of got that crazy stiff necked attitude. That's a terrible thing to say about somebody. I many times with a kid, I go to the hospital and somebody's got one of those collars on. I'll say, you know, the Bible says something about stiff necked people. But um, I just, uh, but here he's. He's literal. It's a, and, and he says they're stiff-necked. And he said, I will, if I were to come in to be in the midst of you, he said, I would consume you. I would see the vile things that you're doing, the rebellion that you have. And he said, I would just consume you right there in an instance. I think this is a sorrowful message to the people who he had delivered, he guided, he protected, he provided for all of their needs. And supposedly they were supposed to be his people. But now they are stiff-necked. People he would not want to be, with, be around. I think that would be a pretty disconcerting thing to hear God say Amen. about you as a people. Or us as a people. In verse 4, evidently it bothered them too. Verse 4 says, and when the people heard these evil tidings, they mourned. They got the message and no man put on him his ornaments. These ornaments are those things like all they used to build all the idols. The men didn't give those things. Only the women and children gave those. The men had all those. But now they're not going to put those on. These were those things that were brought out of Egypt. Things that were promoting idol worship that they would wear and remind them of the idols. Verse 5 says, For the Lord had said unto Moses, Say unto the children of Israel, You are a stiff-necked people. I will come up into the midst of thee in a moment and consume And when Moses told them that this is what God said, I think they got real honest with trying to do what was right. In fact, it says in verse 6, And the children of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments by the mount Horeb. They, they just peeled off all of those things that they brought out of Egypt. They didn't want anything to do with them. Thank goodness. A little bit of repentance going on there. Amen. That's what happens. A little bit of repentance takes place. So now then, what is, how does Moses react to this? You know, he's, he's been, he, was, he was over there minding his own business, taking care of the sheep and Midian, and, you know, found his wife and having babies and starting a life. And all of a sudden, God came along and says, come on, y'all got a job for you to do. And he finally gets him to go, and he goes and does what God says, and he has to stand before Pharaoh, and he looks like an idiot on nine different times because he tells him this is what's going to happen, and every time uh, God does exactly what he says, and then they turn around and go back, back the way they were, and finally Moses gets them out of there, and he brings the children of Israel out to the Red Sea, and there he stands at the Red Sea, and here's the Egyptian army coming, and God says, just raise thy staff, and he raises his staff, and God splits the water apart. Moses stands there probably just as much as in awe as the people did because it was amazing what it took place and he, he brings them across he listens as they complain about the water and he goes to God and says what do we do about this water and God says throw a tree in there and he does what God says and God takes care of it and then they come and complain because they don't have enough food and he, Moses goes to God and says God what are we going to do with this and he says don't worry about it I'll send manna from heaven and God does and so every time Moses is man, he's, he's fought the battle he's stood in the gap he's, he's the intercessor and he's gone and he met with God. And, and, and even though these people are, are stiff-necked and rebellious, and, and Moses is probably just about fed up as anybody else, he knows that they're his people. And God has promised them something. And, and so he, he's, he wants to stay connected with God because that's what he needs to do. And so verse 7 says, Moses took the tabernacle and pitched it without the camp. Now, let me just say this about that. 
When you read that, you're picturing your mind the tabernacle. They haven't built the tabernacle yet. What he's talking about is a tent that evidently that had been set up. And you'll remember Moses would sit during the day and people would come to him and he would judge them. This is probably the tent where he sat and judged. And it was probably the tent where he met with God because he would need God to help in all those things. But it's not the tabernacle that we're thinking about because that hadn't been constructed yet. It's going to be constructed later. But he takes this tabernacle, this tent, and he pitches it without the camp. This evidently was in the camp before. This is the place where people would come and share their problems with Moses. Now he's picked that tent up and he's moved it out there, clear out away from the camp. Now they're sitting there looking, where do we go to see Moses? Where do we go to find out our problems, to carry our problems to the Lord? Well, you see that tent way out there? That's where you go. Well, it was a lot easier when he was right here in the camp. Yeah, but we messed up. Now we've got to go out there. Wait, we're not through. And he says, and he called, the ta- called it the tabernacle of the congregation, the tent of the people. I, I don't know why, but I had to think about the people's house in the United States. Amen? The people's house. Ruby and I visited Washington, D.C. last year. Most amazing thing I've ever been to. I just the history, the just to see those buildings, to walk where people walked, that I've studied in history, and to know all the things that happened there. And we wanted to go into the Capitol building, that beautiful building. I would love to have a, a model of that thing. I've looked to see if I could find one. I just, I just think it's a beautiful building. And we wanted to go in that Capitol, but you know, you don't just go in there, even though it's called the People's House. You know. And it's, they're there for us. But let me tell you something. Go up there and just try to walk in. You're going to find that that's a difficult thing, especially nowadays. You can't even get close to it now. But even then, you had to have special um, permission. And then you could only go in certain areas of it. You don't, even though it's the people's house, you don't get to go in all of it. You know? Oh, that part's over there, mind you. Yeah, but you can't go there. Can I go down those stairs? No. You see the sign that says no public down here. Oh, okay. I thought it was the people's house. Well, it's not. Well, let me tell you something. I don't know why I got off of that. But here he says, this is the people's tent. This is the place where people came and felt comfortable coming to talk to Moses, to find out what God would want to do, to try to find out the will of God. Now, notice this. And it came to pass that everyone which sought the Lord went out unto the tabernacle of the congregation. That's what they were used to doing which was without the camp. So now they've had to adjust the way they deal with things. They've got to go outside the camp now to see Moses to find out what God wants them to do, to get his counsel. Verse 8, And it came to pass when Moses went out into the tabernacle that all the people rose up and stood every man at his tent door and looked after Moses until he had gone into the tabernacle. Now, first let's just, just imagine this. I just, I think it's the coolest thing in the world. And two million people camped out in these big, big, huge camp. Two million. Think about how many tents there are, how many different places there are. And all of a sudden, Moses comes out of his tent. Okay. I guess it's time to go up to the tabernacle, the, the tabernacle of the congregation, and let them come up there and ask me all those questions. And he gets going and he starts moving towards the tabernacle. And as he does, people come out on their tent stoops. Or what you call it. Anyway, they come out on the door of their tent and they stand as he walks by. The place gets deathly quiet because the man of God is going to the tabernacle of the congregation to minister to the people. There's more taking place, and I'll share that in a minute. And he's going up there. And now they watch those that are on the the highway or the street where he passes by, they calmly watch as he goes by and they just stand in the door watching as he, dro- as he walks by. I don't know if he may wave or hi, how are you? I don't know. But they're in, they're in reverence to Moses now. He's their intercessor. If nothing else, they realize this man stands for them when God is ready to judge them. He's the one that has prevented everything. He's the one that God that has, has, has had the ear of God to bring their petitions to. So now he heads towards the tabernacle. Verse 9, 
Now watch this. And it came to pass as Moses entered the tabernacle, the cloudy pillar descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle, and the Lord talked with Moses. Now then, that's why they stand and watch. But now then, let's just for a moment think of Moses. Every morning, he gets up, he eats his breakfast, he kisses his wife goodbye. He walks out the door knowing he's going up to that tent that's outside there. And the minute he walks in that tent, he'll meet with God Almighty. Mm, wow. Woo! If I'm Moses, I'm thinking, man, I'm going to get excited. I might even start to run that last little bit, you know, anticipating that I'm going to get to talk with the Lord. I'm going to get to speak with Him. Isn't this going to be awesome that I have the opportunity? Now continue. Watch this. And the Lord talked with Moses. Now, like I said, that's a wow moment to me. Can you just picture that? What, what about being Moses? But let me just say something. Do you know that's the way you ought to wake up every morning? Yeah. Because I'm going to tell you, wherever it is that you meet with God in the morning, he's sitting there waiting to talk to you, Amen. just like he talked to Moses. Amen. I think the most exciting thing I do in the day is that morning I get up out of bed, I go in and get my cup of coffee because me and God are fixing to have a talk. And I sit down and open his word and God speaks to me. I can sit here and wow about Moses all day long, but I'm going to tell you what, I've got a Moses moment every morning. And you can too. And you should. Every one of us should have those moments when we speak with God and He talks to us. And if we don't, we ought to get started. We ought to stop wowing the Old Testament prophets, the Old Testament men who were used of God and start realizing everything God did with them, He will do with us. He wants to, in fact. The only thing that keeps him from it is us. The reason you don't have those moments with God is not because God's not there to meet with you. It's because you didn't show up. Mm, yeah. Amen? That's right. That's right. I know. Still told you time, right? Mm. I stay on it all the time because I believe it's the most important thing you could ever do is to have a quiet time with God. I love the fact you come to church. I think that's important. I love the fact that you may study your Sunday school lesson. I think that's important. But I'm going to tell you, and I, I thank you that you read my post and you go through, you, you listen to my devotions. I, I appreciate that. But I'm going to tell you, that is nothing in comparison to you sitting down with the Word of God by yourself alone and let God speak to you. Amen. There's nothing compares to that. And until I can get you to do that, I'm just going to stay on it, all right? Because I know how important it is. And look at this. Verse goes on to say, and all the people saw the cloudy pillar stand at the tabernacle door. And all the people rose up and worshipped every man. Where? In his tent door. They knew they'd blown it. The tabernacle of the congregation's up there. But where are they worshipping? At their tent door. The pillar is standing in front of the door up there. If they went up there, they wouldn't be allowed to enter in, I don't think, with Moses. And they realized that. They'd blown it. So instead of trying to force ourselves to do that, we just need to be satisfied that right now this is where we need to worship, right here in our tent door. And I don't think there's anything wrong with worshiping in your tent door. You know, as long as you're worshiping, that's a good thing. But I think it's a shame that these who are God's people who God wanted to be in the middle of, that wanted to dwell in the midst of them, are sitting at the tent when they could be at the tabernacle, when they could be at the tent where God is. Verse 11. And the Lord spake unto Moses face to face, as man speaketh unto his friend. And he turned again unto the camp, but his servant jo Joshua... Let's stop there. He spake unto Moses face to face, as a man speaketh unto his friend. Now... You should have a problem with that. Because what God's word says is that no man has seen God. Jesus even said that no one except him has ever seen the Father. So now then, either I'm not reading this right, or Jesus is wrong, or you know what? Neither of those is right. Think about it. He says, he spake to Moses face to face. 
Doesn't say anything about Moses seeing his face, does it? He spoke to him just like a friend would speak. Didn't say anything about Moses seeing him. In fact, we're going to find out as we read it later on that Moses didn't see him. In fact, Moses wants to see him and God won't let him. So what's happened here, it's not the physical face-to-face. Jesus said no man's seen that. But God spoke to Moses, and it does not say anything about a physical appearance. However, this speaks to how personal these meetings were. Face-to-face, as unto his friend, he talked with him. And then Moses turned again into the camp. But notice this, and this is thrown in here just kind of this, this one little sentence because we go right back to verse 12. We go right back to Moses talking to the Lord. But notice what it says, but, this, but his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, departed not out of the tabernacle. So you know what that tells me? Joshua must be camping out at the tabernacle. Now, that's not going to surprise us as we begin to understand that Joshua is being prepared by God to be Moses' predecessor. He's going to be one that leads them into that promised land. Joshua is, the, Joshua is key to all of this. In fact, probably when we finish this, well, we're probably going to Numbers and then we're going to do Joshua. But we're going to study about Joshua. Joshua, Joshua is a key leader to the Israelites. And so we know that he's going to be there. And we know that Joshua, because of what we know is coming, Joshua is going to be one of the two men that stand by faith against the whole congregation. This is a real man of God. And he sees that's where God is. And if I can get in there, I'm not leaving. I'm staying. And for some reason, God allows it. And Moses does too. He stays there. That's what that little portion is thrown in there for us to know. That Joshua (coughs) didn't leave the tabernacle. He stayed there. It's probably where he lived. It's where he took up his residence. He wanted to stay close to wherever God was doing the most work. And that's where God was working. Then we go right back to verse 12. And we find Moses talking to the Lord again. That's why I say that's kind of a, it's just thrown in there for our benefit. He says, and Moses said unto the Lord, See thou sayest unto me, bring up this people, and thou hast not let me know whom thou wilt send with me. Yet thou hast said, I know thee by name, and thou hast also found grace in my sight. Now therefore I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way, that I may know thee, that I may find grace in thy sight, and consider that this nation is thy people. <coughs> Moses gets a little bold. Uh, and it, it doesn't offend God or God would take care of it that way. But here's basically what he says. It's kind of like what we say. You know, when God's doing something and he says, come on, I want you to help me. But he never tells you exactly what he's doing. Man, God, like I said, God's called Moses to do all these things. And he's brought them all the way out here. And he tells him they're going to get him to the, the, the land of milk and honey. But... He says, God, you keep saying you know me and you know that you grace me. And I, and, but God, you still haven't told me how or where or when. You're not giving me all the facts. I sure would like to know what's going on. And by the way, this nation is your people. Did you see that? Consider that this nation is your people. I'm doing this because this is your people. Back and forth we go. Back and forth. You know what? The desire of every believer should be to know him. I like the fact that he said that I may know thee. I think God's appreciative of that. I don't think God takes this as a reprimand or a demand or anything. I think God says this is the way I want you to be. You know, Paul said that, didn't he? He said in Philippians chapter 3, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection. That I may know him. I think every believer ought to have a desire to know God. Know him better. And I'll tell you something. The way you get to know God better is when God puts you through things you don't understand, just sit and watch because God's going to reveal something about him that you've never known before. And it will be the most exciting thing in your life because all of a sudden God has said, did you know this about me? Did you know I could do this? Did you know how I would handle this? And all of a sudden you can sit back and go, man, that's awesome. I was watching a program this afternoon. Y'all need to get this. If you haven't got, it's called, um, what's it called? The Lost... T L K, the lost K K K T. No, it's this lady who in Maine has this restaurant. Have y'all seen this? It's on the it's on the Discovery Plus channel. I'm giving them a plug. Discovery Plus. It's four ninety nine. It's worth it. Great programs. 
uh, Magnolia channels on there, all those great programs. She has this place up there, and she went through a massive divorce. She, she had built this restaurant there in Maine, this little bitty town, and it's the most amazing thing, but she says over and over again, she says, I've found that whenever I'm going through this hardest struggle, I learn things about me I never would have known. Now, I know that's not a Christian, but that's, that's what I'm talking about. We learn things about God that we never knew before. When we're going through those kinds of things, it's amazing how that God reveals himself in those times. That's why he says, be still and know that I'm God. You know why? Because when we get in those moments when we don't know what he's doing, what do we do? We start running and going faster and trying to figure it out and we try to take charge and God says, be still and know that I'm God. That's what we need to do. Just be still. And here we find that uh, this is where Moses is. Verse 14. And he, that's God, and God said, my presence shall go with thee and I will give thee rest. Period. So, Moses says, I want to know who's going with me. I want to know where we're going. I want to know you. I want to know the way. I want to know that I found grace in your sight. And I want you to consider this to be your people. And God said, I'll tell you what I will tell you. Number one, I will always be with you. And secondly, I will always give you rest. And Moses, good. That's not what I ask. It's not what I wanted. But listen, isn't that the greatest news of all? The Lord says, I'll be with you and I'll never forsake you, doesn't he? No matter what you're going through, no matter what the situation is, God promises that he will go with us and he will never forsake us. That's the greatest news of all. Verse 15, and Moses responds, he said unto him, If thy presence go not, if thy presence go not with me, carry us not up hence. That's pretty good, isn't it? Well, if you're not going with us, just, well, just leave us here, you know. Just, well, I think, must, again, Moses is a little frustrated with the answer, maybe. For wherein shall it be known here that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight? Is it not in that thou goest with us? I mean, that's obvious, God. You're going with us. They've seen that. They saw it in the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire. They've seen it. They saw you as you split the Red Sea. They've seen you as you provided the manna. They've seen that. Your presence is obvious. You've had that with us. We got that. He says, shall we be separated, I and my people, from all the people that are upon the earth? God's presence separates us from the world. God's presence in our life separates us from the world. If you're walking with God, God's walking with you. I'm going to tell you, your life has changed in such a way, the world's not going to find you very appealing. They're not going to find that you're going to be the fun guy or the fun gal that you used to be in their realm of what's called fun because now you're walking with God. And God literally is separating you out by His presence in your life. The minute they find out you're walking with God, they're going to go the other direction. And that's the way it should be. And Moses understood that. And that's why he says that. We found grace in thy sight, haven't we? Is it not that thou goest with us? And because of that, we are separated. I and thy people from all the people that are upon the face of the earth. We are, we are special to you because you, we walk with us. All the world was watching and listening about this, these people crossing the desert. You know that? Everywhere they went, people said, we've heard about you. You know, we heard about how you defeated Egypt. We've heard how you defeated that people there. We understand that you did that. We understand God's feeding you. We've seen, you know, and they've been hearing all these things that are going on. They know that God walks with his people. And I'm going to tell you something. Even today, people know that about Israel. That's what scares people to death, the enemies of Israel. Underlying their hatred for Israel is their hatred for God. But there's a fear of God that keeps them from going too far, so far anyway. We know that God has a special place in his heart for the nation of Israel. Okay, let's go on. I want to get off on that. Uh, verse uh, 17, thank you. And the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing 
also that thou hast spoken. Now, basically he said, I'm going to answer. I'm going to give you an answer to something. I'm going to provide you with an answer. For thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. So Moses, in understanding that God's presence has separated them out, that God's presence has made them a special people, God says, you know what, Moses, I understand that, and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to give you one thing. I'll give you one thing. I'll answer. I will do this thing, one thing also that thou hast spoken. What is it? Verse 18 tells us, and he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. I want to see you. God, I want to see you. I want to see your glory. I, I want to see you with all that who you are. I want to see that. Hmm. Well, God says, you know what? I'll make all my goodness pass before you. I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. Let me tell you what God does right there. God establishes the fact that he's still God. Moses doesn't get to call the shots. God says, I'll tell you what, if I show you anything, it's because I want to, not because you've asked me to. I will be merciful to whom I will be merciful. I will, I will do that, God says. See, God's always God. Amen? And he established that even though he is going to give Moses a special answer to this prayer. God does this because he's God. That's why. And he says, verse 20, And God said, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. See, that goes back to what we talked about a while ago where he says face to face. He talked to him face to face. He did talk to him face to face, but not in a, not in a physical way. But he was there. Verse 21, And the Lord said, Behold, there's a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock. And it shall come to pass while my glory passes by that I will put thee in the cliff of the rock and will cover thee with my hand while I pass by. And I will take away mine hand and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall thou not see, not be seen. Now, I think that was such a special honor that God bestowed upon Moses to be able to see that, to see God in that way. To know that God allowed him that opportunity to see that. Can I tell you that that place is still available for you if you want to see God's glory? He tells us exactly where it is. Did you hear that? He says, first of all, it's by me, he says. You're going to have to get close to God. You're going to have to stand up there next to him, amen? You can't do this from far away. You've got to be next to him. You've got to be by him. And that means you've got to be... You've got to be ready. Secondly, you've got to stand on the rock. We know who that is, don't we? Jesus Christ. You stand on the rock. And then he says you need to be in the cliff of the rock or in the rock. And the rock, again, is Jesus. You want to see God's glory? Get close to the Lord. Get close to God. Stand on the rock, Jesus, and be hidden in the rock. God will show you his glory. That's a powerful thought. I love the fact that we have those opportunities. I, if there's nothing else from this lesson tonight, I tell you, for me, the thought is that we have the opportunity to know God, to see God, to be used of God, to have his hand on us, to, um, to know that whatever is going on around us, God has it all figured out and has plans for it. And all we have to do is just... Be still and he can take it. There's so much here for us in this lesson tonight. And I hope that you grab some of that. Because we need to be walking with God. We need to be in his word. We need to be listening to what he has to say. Stop trying to figure it out without using God's word. You've got to get into God's word if you're going to figure out what God's doing. Yeah, have you ever talked to somebody and their favorite statement is, Well, I believe. You ever heard them? Well, I believe. And, you know, I get in conversations with these people. Well, I believe this, and I believe that, and I believe blah, and I believe blah, 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 blah. <clears throat> Tell me what you believe about this book, because that's where the truth lies. Mm -hmm. Not in what you think or believe, not in what I think or believe. It's what God says that matters. And we ought to spend time in God's Word. 
Go to where God's at and stay with him. Walk with him. Learn from him. Amen? Amen. All right. Any question, comment, or thought? You're telling us you showed the lost kitchen. The lost kitchen. Thank you. So I tell you what. We need a restaurant like that around here. That is amazing. Y'all need to watch that. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's worth your time. It's, it's really good. Really good. The Lost Kitchen. It's on, it's on Discovery Plus. You have to get Discovery Plus to get it. But that channel's worth paying a little extra for, I'm telling you, because it's got some good stuff on it. All right. Uh, enough of the advertising. <laughs> uh, any other question, comment, or thought? Thank you. All right, then let's stand and be dismissed with a word of prayer. Let's have a great week. Amen. Hey, listen, I challenge you. If there's one challenge, if you're not having a quiet time with the Lord, start that tomorrow. Yeah. Start that first thing in the morning. Morning's the best time to do it. You say, well, I've got to go right to work. Well, get up just a little bit earlier. Set your alarm clock about 15 minutes earlier and give God 15 minutes before you start your day. You will not, you will, if you will do that, if you'll do that for 30 days, it will transform your relationship with God. Amen. Just 15 minutes a day. You just won't believe what it would do for you. Uh, so I challenge you for that. Father, Lord, I thank you for this evening. I thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you, Lord, for the opportunity we've had to be in the house today, to enjoy the fellowship, to know, Father, that we in the church have been gathered to enjoy fellowship, enjoy teaching, preaching, listening, learning, singing, praising, giving, sharing. God, thank you for those opportunities. We love you and thank you for being our God and our Savior and our Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 God bless you.